Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel. Uh, watching over the truth in the news, today's date is the 27th of May, the early hours, uh, 2014. Welcome to all listeners. Great to have you listening to Truth Sentinel. You're most welcome. Uh, I hope you stay with us and listen to uh, any back episodes. And uh, we've got a nice long episode for you today bit of a bumper episode because we're tackling quite a big topic which is religion. Um, today's news, Elliot Roger, son of Hunger Games assistant director who had recently been interviewed by police after his parents were worried about his behaviour, uh, went on the rampage killing seven people uh, last count, uh, has injured more, three of them he killed with a knife, um, I'm sure this will be used by gun control activists anyway though. Um, confectionery tycoon Petro Poroshenko has won a victory in Ukraine's presidential election. Uh, he's well known because of his Russian chocolate, which I've actually tasted. It's very nice. So if that's anything to go by, then the, the future could look a bit more positive. Um, I think Yulia Tymoshenko came a distant second. Pope Francis is uh, on a tour of the Middle East at the moment. And um, he's been trying to stay out of politics, but not trying very well by the looks of it because um, he's been sort of um, being being involved in politics anyway but um, um, basically it looks like he's trying to aim for a bit of peace anyway speaking in Bethlehem the Pope invited the Israeli and Palestinian presidents to the Vatican to pray for peace so that's always a good sign um, I had to mention some of the stupidity of the laws over here in the UK on today's episode probably influenced by the European Parliament, but according to the Daily Mail, 18 criminals who were on the run after escaping from prison in the UK had their identities protected from the media as it would infringe their personal data rights. There, that's just an example of some of the crazy laws we've had over here. Um, this week's news, the Thailand's military has announced it was taking control of the government and uh, suspended the constitution. That's a fairly re regular occurrence in Thailand uh, these days. I remember uh, some years ago I was there and they did exactly the same thing then. But it follows months of political turmoil in Thailand. Let's hope for peace there. I'm, I'm planning to go there in uh, maybe two or three months actually. So we may be able to do some reports from Thailand, see how things are getting on there. I would imagine as a tourist over there at the moment, that they would they would probably notice almost nothing. Uh, despite the, you, you've probably heard the reports of curfews. I remember I was there before when there was a um, queue and um, it doesn't really affect people over there travelling. It didn't affect me last time anyway. Everything continued as normal. A roundup of last episodes. Uh, last episodes we had a nice chat with John Gary. Really enjoyed talking to him about world events. Sometimes it's nice to get just to get someone on and just have a have a normal, just relaxed chat. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you haven't heard it, um, just, you know, make a cup of tea, relax, sit down and um, listen to that. It's, it's just a nice, relaxing chat. Okay, today's um, show, which is going to be longer than normal by the looks of it. I haven't quite finished making it yet, but it's looking like it's going to be more like a two-hour show. Um, we're going to talk about a controversial subject, a subject that brings hope, strength, peace to many whilst unfortunately bringing war and destruction with it too, uh, if you look at history. The subject is religion, and today we'll be focusing on Christianity, atheism, um, but also a little bit of Buddhism and Islam. First, we're going to go to Anthony, our academic researcher from the University of Bilkent, who will answer some of the questions on religion from an atheist point of view. Hello, Anthony. Hi, hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. Welcome back to Truth Sentinel. Oh, thank you. It's good to be back, as always. Good, good. Um, how have you been? I've been pretty well. Uh, it's uh, been an interesting couple of weeks to be in Turkey, I must say. Uh, yeah, a lot of things. I heard the, about the mining disaster. What um, what sort of things have been going over on in uh, Turkey? Well, yeah, we had the summer mining disaster, which was, was a, a real tragedy. Uh, the last count I heard was about 280... Uh, fatalities, which is really, uh, you know, shocking and tragic. But uh, actually, what happened here was that the, the tragedy turned into outrage. 
um, by the time the government got there, it, it had become apparent that, you know, because of corruption and so on, uh, the safety standards in the mine were not up to spec. And there was a, a protest, quite a large one, which uh, gave rise to, I think this, this photograph is, is very famous now, that uh, one of the PM's aides kicking a protester. Have you seen that photograph? Yeah, I mentioned it in our last uh, Truth Sentinel, actually, um, yeah. where he's kicking the guy and he's held... He's being held down by two soldiers, and yeah. he, it just makes him look ridiculous because it's like you know you can act all very tough when, when the guy's being held down by two soldiers with machine guns. Exactly. He's wearing yeah. a suit. It's it's just looks ridiculous. So that guy was one of the the PM's aides, and he was with the PM at the time, uh, and the PM essentially told him to kick that guy. <laughs> but then a video emerged uh, that that provided a little bit of background on that. Apparently, it's the same guy in the video. And the, and the famous photo. So in the video, what you see is uh, the guy boos Erdogan, and uh, Erdogan obviously just thinks, uh, well, I'm the PM, you don't boo me, and he just bitch slaps the guy. <laughs> um, he literally just reaches out and slaps him overhand, uh, which which just stunned me. I mean, uh, that's, you know, not something that I can imagine David Cameron doing, for example. <laughs> obviously, being uh, the Prime Minister is um, quite a different job in Turkey. Mm, yeah, definitely. But it's interesting. I, I mean, <clears throat> uh, and this, uh, yeah, this this really has, I guess, stirred things up again. I, I don't quite know what's going to happen, but uh, I have noticed there's been a really marked increase in the military presence in the last week. So here where we are, there are helicopters and military planes flying over us all the time now. I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but something seems to be going on. Mm. So we'll, I guess we'll talk about that a bit later as as, uh, as events continue unfolding. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I mean, um, keep us up to date with what's going on there. Yeah. Um, you asked me uh, this week if I'd like to give my views on the question of uh, religious belief. Yes, today's show is about uh, religion and... Uh, I thought we could talk about, uh, we're going to focus probably on Christianity, Christianity and uh, atheism. So um, what was it you were going to uh, sort of talk about today? Well, I know that you're going to talk uh, a bit later with a person of faith. So uh, I want to uh, give you another perspective. Um, just, you know, uh, survey the field, let's say. <laughs> uh, so I'll start off by, by stating I guess what's incredibly obvious, which is that when you, you have an exchange of views about religious beliefs, you know, the first question you need to answer is, uh, does does God exist? Yeah. But you know, the, the way these discussions tend to go is that uh, there are also a lot of other questions surrounding that, you know, that, that get bundled in. So, so things like, uh, where did the universe come from? How did life arise in the universe? And so on and so on. Let me say at the start that I, I would consider myself more or less an atheist. And by, by that, by more or less, I mean uh, I find the idea of God's existence really, really unlikely. Uh, but in, in saying that, um, I mean, you'll notice that I'm hedging. You know, I'm saying unlikely and more or less. So I'm really talking about probabilities here more than anything. Uh, some atheists would not use those words. You know, they feel absolutely certain that there's no God and so on. I'm personally not quite as sure as those guys. Um, I think anything's possible. We can't rule it out. And uh, a bit later, I'll, I'll explain why I think that. But I'm saying that no nothing that I've seen or heard or learned uh, in life gives me any reason to think that the, the God hypothesis is, is a, an especially likely one. Um, Can I just interrupt for a second? Um, of course, yeah. Atheism. Um, I think there's been some debate as to what it actually means as well. I mean, some people say it's a lack of belief in the existence of God. And some people have sort of argued, well, if you don't believe, if you're sort of saying there is no God, that's a belief in itself, you know. So yeah. you, you have to define, you know, atheism itself, really. Yeah, and uh, a lot of atheists are so because they have a belief in a competing hypothesis, yeah, so a scientific hypothesis, for example. Um, and yeah, you, you do have quite a range of views that get kind of uh, captured by this umbrella term. So you've got your pure atheists, you've got people like me who don't 
claim to know for certain, but they're, they're fairly confident about the no-God thing. Um, and you've also got what I would call uh, extreme atheist views. Um, so to take an example, we, we could use that term, I think, uh, about the, the scientist Richard Dawkins. Dawkins, you probably know, uh, he wrote uh, the best-selling book, The God Delusion, in 2006. And he, um, he's made a career, or a second career, I could say, out of, you know, touring the world, poking fun at religious people, saying incredibly pompous and arrogant stuff, and <laughs> generally just making a dick of himself and making all atheists look bad. Now, so, you know, he's not exactly the guy you want in your corner, but, but he does have his, his followers. Uh, but in terms of uh, his outlook and his views on the world, uh, Dawkins and, and people who agree with him, I would, I would describe them as fundamentalists uh, because their faith in science and in specific doctrines that the, the scientific community holds to be true, it's very similar to the faith of, say, uh, you know, a, a fundamentalist Southern Baptist or whatever. Um, and he actually says in The God Delusion, that the question of whether God exists is a scientific question for science to solve. So <laughs> he believes that science will solve this question eventually, and everyone else will have to accept the solution because science is just so much more legitimate than any other form of inquiry or any other kind of thinking. That's and interesting because um, it doesn't seem to me that um, science is trying to answer that question. It seems to me a lot of the time they've already felt like they've come to a conclusion on that and that they're not actually investigating it. I would say that there are some parts of the scientific community who are, are very focused on that and it, it, their views were very fashionable. There was a wave of uh, popular science books published in the, in the 1990s and so those views were very well publicised around that time. Uh, at the moment I would say that wave has subsided so we're not hearing so much from those people. Um, but, you know, this view that, that, that science is going to provide all the answers and that, that no, other, uh, no other field can provide those answers, I, I would say that's an extreme viewpoint. That's a fundamentalist viewpoint. I'm definitely not there with that. Uh, but I, I wanted to make a, a point about religious faith generally and why I'm not inclined towards it or inclined towards pure atheism. Um, See, in my view, uh, any kind of belief about a, a being or a force that, that exists outside of our universe, it runs into a, a fundamental problem, which is that we can't look outside our universe. Um, and to give you an idea of why, why I'm saying that, I want to use a computer metaphor. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to talk a fair bit about computers, and I, I have to apologize for that, because, you know, computers are computer metaphors are generally a bit silly. Uh, you, you know, you hear people say, uh, oh, the mind is like a computer, and I, I usually think, I switch off at that point. But in this case, I think it's appropriate. So I want to ask you a question. Are you familiar with Flappy Bird? Who? Flappy Bird. Um, is he a relative of Angry Bird? <laughs> he, he's, I would say, actually, yeah, he's kind of a distant relative. Yeah. He's uh He's a little bird, and he stars in a game called Flappy Bird. Uh, it's a little uh, 2D style retro game where you have to maneuver the bird through sets of pipes. He's flying along against a flat background. Right? We've all played games like this. Yeah? The game where you have to kind of get through walls, and you're trying to avoid hitting the walls, and there are things that you hit that will kill you, and other things that will feed you. That sort of stuff. Have you so been game... smoking again, Anthony? <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I, I thought this was a discussion on religion. <laughs> well. It is. <laughs> so this is a really simple game, right? It's extremely repetitive. It's got no uh, evolution, you know, no different levels. It just goes and goes and goes, and the bird just flies and flies. And it was a huge hit last year. Um, then something a bit strange happened. In February this year, uh, Flappy Bird's creator, who's a, a Vietnamese programmer, his name is Dong Nguyen, he removed the game from Apple's App Store and from Google Play. Those are the main places where you could get hold of Flappy Bird. And he said, this is too addictive. I'm experiencing too much guilt about this and removed the game. So suddenly it was gone, right? 
-hmm. you can still you can still play it on some websites and people who had phones with the app already installed sold their phones at huge prices because it was the only way then to get the game but basically flappy bird was killed by his own creator and his universe just winked out of existence so i want you to imagine that you are flappy bird <laughs> sometime before february and you i'm having trouble getting my head around that <laughs> okay <laughs> you've managed to evolve consciousness okay so one day you're flying along between these pipes and you start asking yourself some some existential questions like why is my life this way why do i always fly in one direction why am i here at all where are these pipes coming from is there someone controlling me who created me um and the thing is they're all unanswerable questions for flappy bird for anyone inside the game these questions are unanswerable out here in our world we can see that there's nothing especially unusual or mystical about the creation of Flappy Bird's world. You know? uh, but Flappy Bird himself can never see that because his world is bounded. You know? So he can't answer these existential questions. And to me, that's our situation. Our, our world has boundaries you know, where uh, we exist in space time. And sometimes uh, you hear the expression, the envelope of space time which I think is a, a pretty accurate expression. I mean, we, we can't suddenly jump out of it, you know, any more than Flappy Bird can just jump out of the screen and look us in the face and go, ah, oh, it's you. We, we just can't do that. So it's kind of a fundamental barrier and a property of nature that we can't know how it was created. That, that would be my view. I've, um, I've also heard a scientist saying that we literally are living in that existence, that... Um, I remember uh, I quite shockingly listened to this scientist and it kind of it blew me away a bit. He was saying that um, at some point in the future, computer game technology will develop so much that we will be able to create, recreate our own universe to such an extent that it will be like reality. And he said um, that uh, he said basically it's probably already happened. And he said the chances uh, of the of us living in a simulated world now are extremely high and he said he, in fact he said that at some point in the future there'll be so many of these creations of the universe that um the chances that we're not actually living in one now are extremely remote he was basically saying we're living in a simulated computer game now and that's uh that's based on a uh a scientific field of inquiry uh there were physicists who, who researched extensively this idea of uh, the universe as an information processing uh, mechanism and discovered that, yeah, like, there, there, there is a lot of simulation that kind of naturally happens. Processes simulate each other. And, and it eventually led to this question, could we be a simulation of ourselves? Uh, I have no answer to that question. Sorry. I wonder, I wonder <laughs> if there's any way to prove whether we are or not. I do remember reading that someone was trying to do that, but um, it would be interesting to know uh, whether it, it was provable, because um, it's quite a scary thought to think that this is all. Maybe I mean I think the guy was suggesting that this has all happened before. We're just reliving a uh, a, a print of uh, a simulated universe that occurred before, and it's quite a scary thought, really, that we don't actually exist. A bit like Flappy Bird. It is a bit scary, and. It, um... If, if somebody was to try and inquire into whether we're a simulation, they could be simulating an inquiry into that which happened in the real world, which they're simulating. Okay, I, I definitely Sorry. need to, uh, <laughs> to hold on to my forehead at the moment. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I also think a, an interesting uh, little um, snippet of history uh, in, in reference to simulations, though this is totally off topic, but it doesn't matter. Uh, during the first uh, Gulf War, uh, in 1991, the commander of the armed forces was a guy called General Norman Schwarzkopf, and he was really into military simulations. And he was simultaneously to running the war, he was also running several simulations of different military campaigns. You know? And uh, everything that came across his desk, after a while, uh, they, they created uh, stamps so that they could mark everything that came across his de desk as real-time or simulation, because up to that point, people were becoming confused as to which information 
was about the real war and which information was about simulated wars. That's it's, it's funny scary. you should say that, actually, because um, uh, on a coming show, we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be investigating patterns in world events. Mm -hmm. And one pattern that seems to have occurred in a lot of events, which a lot of people have picked up on, is the, the fact that there's been sort of simulate, simulations uh, and drills of events that have been occurring. Like in 9-11, there was supposed to be drills occurring the same day, depicting an event of, of planes crashing into a building in, in, uh, in England when the... Uh, when the terrorist explosions went off here, there were supposed to be drills happening that same day, the same with the Boston bombings. So, and there was confusion as to what was the drill and what was the reality. I've heard similar things. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic. I'm looking forward to, the, to that one. Yeah, anyway, sorry, please carry on. That's fine. No, that's fine. Uh, so, again, we, we can see that as soon as we, we ask, uh, is there a God, you start getting you start straying into other questions like how did the universe get started yeah. um, and there's also the related question about life as I mentioned before so looking at the uh, the religious point of view you know exponents of a religious view of the world uh, generally use the argument by design or intelligent design yeah. and and the argument goes that uh, if you look around the universe you see so much order and uh, complexity and beauty and so on, that, that it's, it's logical to conclude that, that there's a creator. In fact, it's illogical to conclude anything else. That's the argument. Yeah. And one of, the, um, one of the trump cards in the debate is that life arose in the universe. So people of religious faith uh, will argue that life can't arise without something, let's say, metaphysical, to set it in motion or to plan its appearance because it involves such a large amount of organization that this just couldn't happen automatically. Plus we all know the concept of entropy which is that things in the universe tend towards less order over time, not more. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's important to notice with this that this intelligent design argument uh, covers two separate points. It covers the cosmic origins yeah, who, who started the universe off, and it covers the appearance of life. Uh, and it's really helpful to, to separate them, because they're actually separate questions. So about uh, this idea of life arising contrary to what you'd expect in a universe with no creator, uh, first, I, I think it's important uh, to say that this word entropy has been horribly overused and, and misused it doesn't apply to individual biological systems, for example, because those systems don't tend to chaos over time. That's not what entropy is meant to describe. Secondly, uh, there's good evidence that systems can self-organize, and uh, this is where we need to start talking about computers again, I'm afraid, <laughs> uh, because self-organization as a field of study, it goes back to uh, the 1940s, uh, and in 1970, there was a mathematician named John Conway who invented a zero-player game called the Game of Life. Uh, if you want to play, all you do is set up some initial conditions for a two-dimensional universe full of cells. Uh, and the cells can either be alive or dead. So you, you plug in your initial conditions, and you, you see how the cells uh, evolve through time. And they do evolve quite dramatically. In fact, they, they start to self-organize um, into organisms. They, they, they collect together into complex organisms, which live in even more complex systems, and they, they evolve different strategies for surviving into future generations. But most, uh, most amazingly, once they get to a certain level of complexity, they start uh, choosing between strategies, uh, between survival strategies. So, look, in order, in order to make choices, you can argue, there needs to be some kind of center of consciousness uh, trying to predict the outcomes of different strategies and choosing the best one. So, so basically, uh, we found, we, we can see in this game, societies organizing themselves and consciousness spontaneously arising. And um, I just wanted to ask, um, wouldn't it actually sort of go down on the case of uh, creationists who would say, well, 
all you're doing there is sort of saying that it would God's job might have been easier. He might have created a simpler universe, and then some of the bits would have got more complex later. That's yeah. That's a that's a very good point, and that that goes back to what I said earlier, which is uh, in response to this intelligent design argument, you need to look at it in two segments. One is uh, who created the universe, or was it created, and the other one is. Once it was created, how did life arise in it? Because it's it's life that the creationists will say proves the existence of God. Without without God, there would be no life. So the point of this uh, this this game is to say, well, life doesn't need to be created per se, yeah? but it doesn't uh, explain where the universe came from. In fact, to have a, a game of life universe, you need to set the initial conditions of the universe. So that would be playing the role of God. Yeah. So it only addresses the second part of the question about life. It doesn't address cosmic origins. Yeah, I mean, um, and I know some creationists would have a problem with the Big Bang theory, but in some ways that could, could you know, that still is not a big problem with the creationist theory, and that God could have said, could have created the bang. It could have maybe been speeded up so it wasn't over millions of years. It was just bang, everything falls into place. Uh, there, you know, we've got um. Whether, whether Earth is the center of the universe is another question. Whether our planet is special in, in any way and whether there's life on other planets, that's another, another show. But, um, yeah, indeed. But, you know, if, if Earth is special and, you know, this the universe that we see around us, uh, where we are the special part of it and uh, all the planets were positioned in the correct position from the Big Bang, um, there, there's so many different, like like you said before, this there's so many different uh, routes we can go down in this discussion. But um, um, I wanted to respond to your your point about the Big Bang. In fact, the Big Bang fits reasonably well with some theologies. Uh, in the Middle Ages, for example, there was this uh, idea of creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. So so. Uh, in that theology, God creates everything in one go. He creates space, time, uh, and everything that, that occupies space and time out of nothing. Uh, and, and that is essentially a Big Bang scenario. So there's really no conflict there. And um, what would an atheist uh, have to say about the, uh, the complexity of, um, of the universe we see around us and of, of Earth itself and the, the different species of animals? What would their, what, what's the most a atheist explanation for that? An atheist would, would probably approach it from the point of view of evolution. Uh, Darwin's theory has been outlawed in several states of the USA. Uh, I mean to say that the teaching of Darwin's theory in schools has been outlawed uh, because, or it's been in, in other places, uh, the approach has been let's present it as one of a possible range of theories and give equal weight to creationist theories because Darwin's theory does, in some respects, threaten uh, some Christian points of view on the world and where humans came from. The, the idea that we're special. You know, in the Bible you can find uh, a, a worldview which says there's the creatures of the world, there's nature, and then there's us, an entirely different order of things, of an entirely different order of beings. Uh, whereas Darwin's theory suggests that most of the differences between us and, say, other primates are differences of degree. They're not differences of kind. So, yeah, um, there is a, there is an opposition there. But uh, atheists would say, look, you, when you look back through through time, what you see is uh, a gradual gradual path of evolution, which has ended up with us and several million other species and no God necessary for that to happen. But what about things like I mentioned before, you know, the sun, the moon seems to be in the perfect position. There's whole books been written on that. In fact, I read a good book uh, the other, uh, recently called Who Built the Moon, written by um, Christopher Knight and Alan Butler. They come to a different conclusion in, at the end of the book, which uh, we, we might even invite one of them onto the show at some point. But um, yeah, that'd be wonderful. It's an intriguing book. I mean, it basically says that you know, if you look at the dimensions of the moon, the way it, um, the way it fits in with the sun, um, the way the position of it, it shouldn't be there, and it's, it proves that there, that there is something going on. Basically, that that um, the universe around us, um, particularly the moon, um, shows that 
whether it be a creator or some other explanation, there has to be, it didn't just happen, you know. And they come yeah. up with a very way out there theory, which is, um, I'll, I'll leave it to people to read the book anyway. It's called Who Built the Moon? So uh, the book was written by Christopher Knight and Alan Butler. And they're basically saying that um, the moon is positioned exactly where it is uh and it couldn't be anywhere else. Yeah, that is that is very true. Uh, it's a dilemma that uh, a number of scientists have, have looked at. And the, the name for this is the Goldilocks effect. So the idea that the universe is just right. Uh, for example, with the Big Bang Theory, uh, if the force of gravity had been uh, at something like 0.01 of a percent weaker, then the universe would have flown off so quickly that, that planets wouldn't have been able to form. Uh, or sorry, stars wouldn't have been able to form. And if it had been something like 0.01 of a percent stronger, then it would have pulled the matter back into the center, and the universe wouldn't have taken its present shape. So it's it's a yeah, it is definitely a dilemma for for a rationalist or scientific point so, of yeah, view. Yeah, I would say it's a fairly compelling argument. Um, I mean, yeah. I know I, I've had many many discussions about this with friends and. Uh, one of my friends would say, um, well, but there's thousands of thousands of universes or millions of universes even, so the chances of it not happening are pretty remote. You know, if you if you have enough, if enough of these things occurring and enough universes, then it's fairly likely at some point that everything's going to fall into place. Well, that's a, that, that's a reasonable argument too, I think. And that, that's been the main argument against this Goldilocks effect, that, you know, why are we here? Why, why doesn't our moon fall, crash into the Earth and kill us all? The answer is because there are billions of planets that, that um, you know, have moons, and some of them crash and, and, and uh, destroy the planet, and some of them don't. And statistically, we're just lucky. Well, in some ways, then people would say, well, we are special then. Mm, true, maybe we are. Uh, but then, yeah. my, then my friend would say, no, no, because there's thousands and thousands of universes and so we're just one of of many special uh special universes which have fallen into place but we we really are getting into territory now which proves how how wacky science has become and how science has become a faith because they uh this this multiple universe theory ha is accepted now uh by by reasonably large sections of the scientific community and you know we were talking before about flappy bird and not being able to get out of the game to see what's happening outside well, I'm sorry, but to see that uh, to get to find gather any evidence of multiple universes, you have to get out of this one and go into other ones, and that's simply impossible. I agree, actually. I mean, I do feel like a lot of science is based uh, based on stuff that we can't possibly know, and and also I feel like about the past, a lot of the assumptions about the past seem to be based on mathematical calculations and. Uh, and things that we just can't, you can't really know stuff until you are you were there or you, you can travel to other universes, you know. Like, like I mean, I, 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 it was a bit of a flippant remark, but I talked about um, the missing plane and just, you know, how we can't even deal with mysteries that occurred a few weeks ago, um, you know. And it seems like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about that happened millions of years ago, um, we can't really talk, talk about with any authority if we can't deal with stuff that ha this happened recently. I, I think uh, I think that scientific method is very powerful, but I I, all, I share your uh, cautious cautiousness. Um, and there there are a couple of problems with uh, with scientific theories explaining the origin of the universe. Yeah. So if you compare uh, the theory of Brownian motion, which is about how fluids uh, behave. For example, you pour cold milk into a hot cup of coffee. The milk initially sinks to the bottom, but then there's a form of motion which makes the milk swirl around and mix with the coffee, right? That's called Brownian motion. And if you're trying to understand Brownian motion, you can take a million cups of coffee and watch one of them at a time until you've seen it so many times that you understand it. You can't do that with the Big Bang. So that's are, are you um, are you trying to hint for another coffee break? <laughs> no, <laughs> but you see what I mean. There's you, you can't repeat the experiment. You know, you, your theory will only ever be a theory in the sense that uh, you, nobody can observe it and go, oh yeah, you're right. Look at that. So it's a big problem. Yeah. Um. Should we? Um. I mean, we could talk about this forever, as we've already uh, acknowledged. Should we move <laughs> on to another part of this, which is uh, morals? Yeah. Let's. 
Um, yeah. And I was going to say, you know, is it is it really such a bad thing for people to have some kind of faith they can believe in, such as Christianity, where they can uh, follow a sort of moral moral code? Has it not sort of done any good for for humanity in in some ways? Yeah, I think um, I think the question here is whether uh, whether religion precedes morality or whether it's the other way around. And and religious people would obviously answer that. Uh, that humanity has benefited from religion because it's, it's provided a moral compass for believers, you know, whereas atheists would tend to say, look, morality exists as part of uh, humanity, as part of humanism, and religion uh, borrows it or simply tabulates moral truths that are more or less general. Yeah. But, but maybe for some, I mean, you know, if, if someone has a good upbringing, then they've obviously been taught morals by their parents, or maybe they've had some uh, already existing morals but then you know not not everyone some people grow up in an extremely uh, different environment where maybe they've had any existing morals sort of drummed out of them and they've been replaced with bad morals and then you know for for some people I, i'm thinking of maybe say people let's let's look at criminals in prison there's some criminals in prisons who've turned uh, turned to god or found christianity and i, I just wanted to give one example um mm -hmm. one of the killers of um uh, the uh, the Manson murders, the killers of Sharon Tate. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with that story? Yeah. Uh, one of the killers, Charles Tex Watson, um, he was obviously pre previously a brutal murderer. He's now the church minister in the prison where he is, and he's got a wife and children and corresponds with the daughter of one of the people he murdered. Um, and she's forgiven him. He's a, he's uh, asked for forgiveness. He's changed his ways. Obviously, he's still incarcerated. So some people would argue, well, it, you know, has, it's not really doing anything. But you know, isn't that a good thing that someone's sort of he he's used he's found this new moral code which previously he obviously wasn't following. You know, I think I I, I think that's true. But I, I I mean, it's also it provides a good example because Charles Manson himself has become. Uh, we could say, in some respects, uh, a conscience type figure. You can find uh, videos of Charles Manson on the internet, for example, talking about climate change and pollution before this topic became popular. He has been exhorting the world to stop polluting itself into oblivion for decades. Uh, he is a madman, <laughs> but uh, he has true insight, and he found that I would say after the whole incident with the family, he's found some kind of new mission in life. You can find that I think when people people go really badly off the rails, they do need to make a turn in their lives where they where where they they put that behind them and find a, a better way to live. We could say a, a more moral way to live. Yeah. And religion is one way that some people uh, manage to achieve that, but there are many other ways. That's the atheist point of view. You don't need to find Jesus in order to become a good person. I think. There I are... think. Um, I mean. I think that's that's got to be true, or I, I would think that's true anyway. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I've met plenty of plenty of good people who uh, aren't Christians. In fact, I've met many people who aren't Christians who live a far more moral life. And obviously, there's some Christians who don't. You know. So, yeah, it doesn't seem to be the only thing about uh, having a faith. Um, yeah. What, what about what about things like um, good work, you know, like charities and stuff, which are done by Christian yeah. communities? That's yeah. I think that's a, a very. I, I think you need to separate the issue into uh, into grassroots believers versus the hierarchy of the of the church. And I think for grass grassroots believers, okay, the church does great things for them. It it gives them a channel to. Uh, in, in some cases, people who are motivated to do good things, the church gives them a channel through which they can do those good things and surround themselves with other people who are equally committed to doing good things and gain, I guess, further inspiration and support from doing that. So that is a fantastic thing, obviously. That's quite different from uh, a situation where you've got uh, an ecclesiastical authority telling you how to live. And... <coughs> uh, that's, I think, where a lot of atheists start to get annoyed, is that, that uh, people, they, people are okay with others having a different belief, you know? but when those, those others turn around and say, uh, 
this is what you can do with your body, this is what you can't do. Yeah? Or uh, you don't share our beliefs and therefore you're an immoral person. Then, then atheists start to get offended. And I think that's fair enough because I would say there are many ways to live a moral life. You, know, you don't, uh, different people find, find uh, morality inside themselves and outside themselves in all kinds of places. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, on the same kind of vein, like, um, there's been some cri uh, criticism of um, religions in general, but also Christianity about things that have happened in the past, you know, like things like the Crusades. But yeah. could, but couldn't it also be argued that, yeah, but those those kind of events were, were being um, carried out by people who weren't really Christians. They were the hierarchy that, that you're talking about. These were the... You know the people at the top who were, were doing these things not not people at the bottom who just wanted to follow the teachings of you know love your neighbor be good to each other you know whereas the people at the top were like yeah we're just going to send our our horsemen into this city and in, and try and enforce people on the uh, you know the the bequest of the queen to and we're going to kill anyone who disagrees you know yeah and the crusades uh, are, are just an abject lesson in just how horrible organized religion can be i mean you had um you had a bishop giving a speech at clairvaux uh in in france uh to inspire the military class in the 11th century to stop fighting each other and go and fight infidels because if they did so they would get into heaven now uh what actually happened in that in that speech was that, yes, the military class turned up, but uh, also did a rabble of thousands and thousands of people, and they had to move the speech out of the church and onto a nearby hillside. So here's this guy saying, uh, if you go and, if you stop killing each other and go start killing infidels, your, your soul will be saved. Uh, and thousands of uneducated people who were in the thrall of the church at that point, because the church was so powerful, started to organize themselves, which was not what the church intended, <laughs> but it was implicit in the message, you know, like, go kill some infidels for credit with God. And uh, then you had uh, people's, people's armies, essentially, crossing Europe and plundering as they went. There were pogroms, killing Jewish communities. Uh, there were um, sackings of cities, like Belgrade was sacked, for example, in the 11th century by these armies because they were not professional soldiers. They'd never marched across the country before and they were getting really hungry, so they started to attack other Christians. By the time they got to Constantinople, uh, the, um, the emperor had heard that they were going to come, in, come uh, Alexius, had heard they were going to come and barred them because they were barbarians and savages. That was before they even got to the Holy Land. They distinguished themselves as particularly savage. So it's, that whole episode in history is an absolute nightmare. And it shows how religion can have a, a very destructive power. But you also have to ask, um, to what extent does religion create that? Uh, in the same way that you can ask, to what extent does religion make people moral and, and to what extent are already moral people attracted to religion? You can also ask the op opposite. Is the church, uh, does the church encourage people to be evil or uh, are people with that kind of inclination attracted to bloodbaths like the Crusades that just happen to be run by the church? It's a very complex question. It is indeed a complex question. I mean, yeah. I, I often have problems with the, I might as well say, it, I, I, know, I know that there's, some of our listeners may be Catholics. Um, I'm, I'm only criticising the hierarchy here when, yeah. it, when, it, when about some of the things I'm saying. I, and I don't understand um, some of the way that um, the Catholic Church is organised. When I think of the Vatican, um, I'm not, I'm not criticising people who follow that faith. I just don't understand it. So um, I'm only asking questions, really. I, I just don't understand uh, why the Pope appears to be worshipped. Why, why? Um, hundreds of thousands of pe people hang on his every word and why the Vatican Church has so much money when we have so many problems in the world you know like for example you know uh, often on TV you see adverts saying you just need a need to contribute a couple of pounds or a couple of dollars to buy a mosquito net in Africa and you'll save a child's life and yet the Vatican could probably end that problem in one foul sweep they've got billions um, so that's what I don't understand, and I, I don't quite understand how 
people like the Pope and and also I mean moving away from religion people like uh, members of the royal fa family allow themselves to be worshipped like yeah, I agree. if someone wanted to bow down to me or, or treated me like a deity I would tell them to stop but it, but it seems like well, you know, sometimes anyway. Um, it seems like the Pope and the and the members of the royal family they don't tell them to stop. They seem to condone this kind of behaviour, and I just don't think anyone should be worshipped. I agree, and I think if you want to look at uh, some very nasty examples of of the church as a as a hierarchical institution being a force for evil in the world, the Vatican is a very good place to look. I'll, I'll give you a couple of brief examples. After World War Two. We had the Nuremberg trials in Germany. Yeah, we had America and uh, Europe's attempts to try to denazify Germany and give the Germans, uh, uh, I guess, a chance to turn on the most despicable Nazis and and um, put them out of the picture in no uncertain terms. It, it, kind of part of the nation's healing, right? You had similar uh, similar genocidal actions taking place in the Balkans. You had a, a party ruling uh, Croatia called the Ustashi, and they were a fascist party. They were uh, attempting the extermination of the Serbs, and they had work camps and concentration camps and the whole box and dice. And after the war, that part of Europe really needed to go through a similar healing process to what was experienced in Germany, and it was prevented from doing so partly by the fact that the Ustashi leaders were given asylum inside the Vatican, to the point where the Ustashi uh, insignia, which was, I believe, a gun and a sword and a something else, three weapons, all crossed, kind of like a swastika made of weapons, the insignia was present on altars while priests and cardinals were saying mass inside the Vatican after World War II. Now, that protection of war criminals had echoes decades later. With, and the, uh, with the protection of paedophiles, do you mean? No, I mean in the Balkans, when the conflicts in the Balkans there arose in the 90s, this fascist label started coming up again because the society there had not had a chance to heal itself after basically a bloodbath. And now in Ukraine, you're seeing similar things. You're seeing these words thrown around that demonize people because the society has not had the opportunity to heal itself after past grim episodes. And the Vatican was absolutely complicit in that. In the same way, they're complicit in the death of many African women from HIV AIDS because they do their utmost to make it to make condoms unavailable and to demonize the use of condoms. And that is because of a doctrinal idea that, that you know contraception is against uh, Catholic belief. Now, if you are a Catholic and you truly believe that contraception is evil, then okay, uh, maybe that is a defensible point of view. But I find it very difficult to to accept that a little piece of rubber is more evil than a command to uh, get all of those pieces of rubber out of a community, which results in people dying. Yeah, no, it's funny you should say that because um, there's, there seems to be a lot of other occasions in the world, not just about Christianity, but about the Muslim religion and other religions where people have a faith which they believe, which is, has got a very noble um, structural beliefs about, about the actual faith. But then to, in order to enforce it, or in, in order to enforce a part of it, people are prepared to kill or do something far, far worse than um, the actual sin they're supposed to have committed. Now, I'll just give a, a quick example, like um, mm. a woman in uh, India or Pakistan who uh, was found to have been having an extramarital affair or or just having premarital sex. Now, you can defend that if you want, but her her punishment for her sin was to be raped by every member of the uh, the village leadership. I mean, it, it's stupid things like that. You know, I mean, that's a worst case scenario, obviously, but there there's, does seem to be a lot of occasions uh, where where we get these things, you know, like with, like with anti-abortionists who, who um, you know, and whether you're pro-abortion or anti-abortion, that's not the issue I'm going to talk about at the moment, but to go in and kill a doctor, to kill a doctor with a gun seems to be just as bad as anything you're trying to defend against. So it's just everything just seems to be messed up, you know. 
I agree. I, I think uh, if we if we talk about Islam, it's it's a quite a different uh, situation uh, because here we're talking about the differences between grassroots believers and and the machinations of hierarchy. Yeah, the church hierarchy in the Christian religion. Well, if you think about it this way, governments can do things which a normal person would never get away with doing. They can do those things because they have law enforcement and the army behind them. Yeah? They're not afraid of us the way we're afraid of them. So that's why governments have more power than we do. Right? The church uh, historically has had more power because it has had the threat of, uh, of hell behind it. And at various times, it's had other threats as well, martial threats, you know. Uh, this also happens in Islamic communities. But Islam is different because it has never had a central uh, authority like the papacy or uh, the patriarch in, in Orthodox Christianity. There's never really been a Vatican of Islam. Um, and that's got positive and negative results. Um, one of the negative results, I suppose, is that, uh, is that Islam is interpreted in a wide variety of ways. I would say even wider than Christianity. And um, many of those interpretations mingle with the pagan beliefs that existed before Islam came to a particular region. Yeah. Um, also, you do, have, uh, you do have some very strongly patriarchal societies in which Islam took hold. They were always patriarchal, and then suddenly they had a religion which they could, uh, which they could interpret to their liking to enforce the, the, the patriarchal order of that society. And it, it, it's produced some really unfortunate results, like, like what you're talking about there. That, that's just inexcusable. It doesn't matter what your religious belief is. It's just inexcusable behavior. And if you use religion to justify that kind of behavior, then, well, uh, I don't know what I can say. <laughs> it's just it's horrible. Well, um, it does seem to be there's a lot of cases these days of people using, who are using religions, um, to carry out acts which they probably would have carried out uh, whether they had their religion or not. They just seem to be using it as an excuse, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's, there's been a, uh, there was an article written a few years ago uh, in the Express Tribune uh, newspaper in Pakistan uh, analyzing the phenomenon of suicide bombings, which is one that we, you know, certainly that's an instance of people doing incredibly extreme things based on their faith, you yeah? Uh, or at least that's how it seems to us. That's how it's often reported in the Western media. Um, there's, there's very often this claim that, you know, these suicide bombers are lured by promises of virgins and all kinds of stuff. You know, you'll get, your family will have financial stability, you'll be a martyr, and so on and so on. That does happen, but in fact, it seems to be a small minority of suicide bombings that are motivated by those kinds of those kinds of uh, extreme interpretations of jihad and other concepts in Islam. Most suicide bombings, it seems, are not surrounded by that kind of mythology. Um, there's, uh, and there's also the fact to bear in mind that there are a few hardline clerics of, in Islam who condone suicide attacks. There have been debates about the legitimacy of suicide attacks, uh, even in the academic in amongst uh, Islamic academics, right? So it is out there as a concept and not everybody, you can't say honestly that every Muslim rejects suicide attacks. That's just not true. However, the vast majority do for a couple of reasons. One of which is that suicide is considered a sin in Islam. You cannot kill yourself in Islam. It's just not accepted. They have a completely different attitude towards suicide than what we do. I just wanted so, to mention something, yeah. which is, um, I think this is probably true what you're saying, and but I I know um, the feeling in England sometimes is that we never hear people talking about this. If 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 um, if Muslims are against some of the atrocities that have happened or against you know suicide bombers, why aren't they coming on TV more and talking about it? It just seems like they could be a bit more vocal, and people people, people get a bit uneasy because it's like. Now, why why is nobody saying? Why are they not actually coming out and you know really appalled by these atrocities? It just they seem a little bit too quiet for my and a lot of other people's liking. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. I, I would say that the moderate voices uh, in Islam, which are the vast, vast majority of voices, uh, have not been well heard. I would say partly um, 
that would be uh, a lack of communicative strategy on their part, and partly that would be the preference of the media for sensationalistic extreme views. Um, but it, you know, if you if you run it through logically, to say these guys uh, these guys became suicide bombers because of Islam, it just doesn't track. You you just you look at um, the other suicide attacks that we've seen in the last in the last hundred years or so, and the, and the most famous example is the, the Japanese kamikazes, who obviously were not Muslims. <laughs> um, and then the Nazis also had a, a, a planned program called Selbststopfer, which was, was a program of suicide attacks. And the Nazis were, were atheists. So um, you, you've got the, the Tamils in Sri Lanka, the Kurdistan Workers' Party here in Turkey. Um, they're, um, they're using suicide bombing. And because they're Muslims, so it's widely reported in the media that that's, that's the motivation. But, it, but, but it's pretty clear in most of those places that it's a political motivation. And also, in the case of Afghanistan, something you never hear in the media is the tribal motivation. Uh, on top of the other strife in Afghanistan, there's still a rivalry be between tribes, which uh, frequently becomes uh, violent. And some of the suicide bombings we've seen in Afghanistan can be traced back to arguments between tribes. So you know, it, again, it's it's very um, it's very it's very difficult to, to to pinpoint this idea of does does religion cause people to do ho horrible things? I think it, it sometimes does. I think sometimes people are going to do horrible things anyway, and their motives are misdiagnosed as being religious. <laughs> And I also think that anybody who gets involved in an enterprise where you drive a car into a compound and blow it up, thus killing yourself and a bunch of other people, um, there's a lot more going on in that person's mind than just devotion to a, to a religious system, you know. And that needs to be taken seriously. We can't just say, "Oh, mad, mad Muslim." Uh, what other factors are leading that person to be there? Unlike the all of the other Muslims in the community where he or she grew up. There's obviously other stuff at work. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I, I wanted to say also that um, the suicide thing can can be a real big issue for, uh, I think, Catho some some forms of Catholicism as well. And I remember, I remember hearing about uh, watching a documentary about 9/11, mm -hmm. and it was about the people who jumped from the building. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was they taken photos, and someone was trying to track down the people who were photographed falling from the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. And um, this guy managed to track down a family which he thought was this, this guy in the photo belonged to that family. And they were saying, no, no, no way, no way. He, you know, I, I think it was a chef or something who was working on the, the top. Um, and um, apparently he deduced that the reason they were saying it couldn't possibly be, be him was because if it was, it would have gone against their religion that he that means he would have jumped and and i just thought well you know you've got to give the guy some credit you know i'm sure he didn't want to jump you know if if it was him uh you know i'm sure it would be a case of the the flames and the fire behind him gave him little little choice so it's it just um it, i think later they admitted it was him but this this became a a huge issue for them that that um he could have jumped through, yeah. cho through choice and thereby mm -hmm. not go to heaven. Uh, yeah. See, that's. The, I mean, that's the problem with, with with fundamentalism. It's not. It's not flexible. It doesn't say, look, these are the ideals that we aspire to. But sometimes the circumstances in which you find yourself give you no choice but to make another decision. Yeah. And, I, and I think with a lot of religions, inclu including Christianity, there's um there's a lot of really sound principles. I mean, if you look, if you analyze most of the the words of Jesus, um, they're, they're fairly good, you know, they're fairly good things. I think uh, uh, with those and with other things, though, um, a lot of things that have occurred with Christianity and other religions is that once humans get hold of a religion and they start organizing uh, hierarchies, like you mentioned before, that's when things turn sour. Because yes. hu humans are useless at following decent rules. Um, I mean, Basically, if someone did, if someone godlike, godlike figure did come down to earth and decided to live amongst us uh, and then said, you know, started talking about peace, 
Uh, you must be good to one another, etc. It stands to reason they're going to be killed fairly quickly, <laughs> I would say, because... <laughs> you're, reminding me, you're reminding me of a song. Uh, the band, it's an old song. Uh, the band is The The, and the song is called uh, Armageddon Days Are Here Again. The line is, um, if the real Jesus Christ were to stand up today, he'd be gunned down cold by the CIA. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> I know. It, it, it's, it's so true, though, isn't it? People, there's so much division in society with so many different opinions that people don't like uh, people coming in and, and telling them to be nice to each other. You know, I remember today, actually, I saw um, the Pope. The Pope's on a visit to Jordan and Israel and Jerusalem, places like that. Oh, good. I'm sure that'll help. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but there's, uh, there's a biblical story about um, Jesus baptizing people in the River Jordan. And apparently later, the Pope is going to be ri visiting the ri vi River Jordan. But th there's a problem because I think it, it may be the Islam religion or another, another religion that believes that he was on the east side of the river, not the west side. And he was baptizing or, or doing it had some religious significance for them on the other side of the river and so there's a big dispute and it just reminded me of the of this problem it's like i think you know people will actually go to war and start killing each other saying no he was on this side of the river no he was on that side of the river it's just it's just crazy you know i i agree i agree and this is yeah i mean one thing that we we i i guess we've hinted at but we we haven't uh attacked directly uh is uh, um, another question which often comes up in, in, in debates about religion versus atheism or, or however you want to, to frame the question, uh, it is, um, uh, is organized religion a bad thing, you know, separate from having faith? Uh, my, my feeling is that I, I don't have a problem with anybody having whatever faith they want to have as long as, as long as the faith doesn't involve, you know, going out and, and, and killing people en masse. No, uh, and I, I think I'd have to agree with you there. Yeah, but but uh, organised religion can can just involve us in in uh, things which are are frightening and ludicrous. Uh, so there's a there's a you know a very I think strong distinction that needs to be to be made in this in this discussion between what people privately believe and and the organisations that spring from that and and some of the the, the uh, fairly reprehensible things they do in the world. True, and I, and I think one of the one of the ways of avoiding this situation is is for is the same thing really, which is what this show represents, which is to question everything. Yeah, uh, and that means also if you follow a religion, which may have really noble um, set of rules to follow, but then your leader comes along and tells you to do something which doesn't even fit in with those noble rules which is quite often the case then yeah. you should question it you know um definitely question anything which is um said by a human who's just the same as you and i living on the earth who tells you to do something it should always be questioned you know yes i agree if we go back to islam for a moment uh, uh the islamic tradition you know we know there are there are sunni there are shia and and so on uh there's also the the Sufis, which are uh, sorry, who are mystics within Islam, uh, they've existed almost since the start, and their idea is that uh, they don't have a relationship with God that goes through any institution. Their relationship with God is completely private, uh, and there's a very long tradition of Sufi poetry and mystical literature, and so on and so on. Uh, however, they've they've had a really rough time you know they, they've fallen in and out of favor depending on where they are and who's governing at the time and there have been there have been uh leaders who have tried to basically exterminate the sufis you know even here at the moment in turkey they're tolerated in a couple of cities uh konya uh, city in turkey is is a home of sufism uh they're tolerated there because they bring in the tourist dollars but generally they're really not liked by the government here at all because they basically say there's no authority greater than you apart from God. So if you're going to have a relationship with an authority, that's the only that's the only authority you need to recognise. And church hierarchies really, really don't like to hear that. Mm. I was just sorry. I was just thinking um, about the. Do you, do you know about the uh, that Baptist church that were sort of going to funerals of uh, soldiers that had been killed during the Iraq war and uh, stuff yeah, like what that. Are they called? What are they called? West something? Baptist Westfield Church? Baptist Church? Was yeah, it? something like that, yeah. 
um, whose uh, whose minister uh, church leader has recently died. Um, I, don't, I don't I don't know who attended his funeral, but um, I think I think they actually had a he had no funeral because there was obviously going to be people uh, turning up at that funeral to cause trouble. But basically, their their opinion was. Um, and you can watch documentaries about it, like uh, Louis Theroux had a good documentary about them. Mm -hmm. um, Westboro, that's what they're called. Yeah, Westboro <laughs> um, Baptist Church. And uh, they were basically, they're very, very anti-gay, you know. And to me, it seems like it doesn't matter what you think. You don't, they're, 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 they're actual, the spirit of their church would, seem, would just seem to be very full of hate. And I, I can't imagine that uh, the Jesus, which they profess to believe in, would actually be behaving in the same way as them. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think that he, he would have attained the popularity that he has um, if he had behaved in a similar fashion to the Westboro Baptist Church. We would not We would never have heard of him, and they would never have heard of him if he, if he was anything like them. Although, like we said before, it doesn't seem like um, you're going to be liked by anyone anyway because, you know, Jesus uh, was supposed to have gone around being good, uh, saying good things and he ended up uh, being killed as well so what is what is the actual answer well the answer to that is uh, never believe anybody who tells you that the Jews killed Jesus because they didn't it was a political murder and uh, if you look at the history of the Catholic Church there was a deliberate decision made at a certain point that the doctrine was going to be created and put about that the Jews killed Christ. That was a deliberate decision. And it was put about, and we've seen all of the horribleness that that has caused. So, you know, that's one to be knocked on the head right away. It was a, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I don't remember the exact circumstances now, but it was a strategic decision made by the church. I feel that it might have had something to do with the Emperor Constantine, uh, adopting Christianity as the official religion of Rome, because in, under those circumstances, it would be very inconvenient to say, "Oh yeah, Jesus, we love him, but you know, we killed him." Um, so let's find another group we can blame. But I'm not sure. I, I, I just can't quite remember now. But I, I do know for certain that 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 doctrine was uh, was was made up. Um, it, it never happened. So yeah, and and we should always question anything which says, uh, you know, this whole group of people are responsible for something that happened thousands of years ago. Because we don't question those things, look what happens, you get the Holocaust. Yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to say linked to what you've said there was, um, it depending on who you listen to, they'll come up with their own research on, um, on certain issues to do with religion, like, you know, if you if you talk to a Christian, they'll come up with their you know people who've proved certain things and said certain things, and they'll refer to scrolls and to um, to documents and to books. And then if you talk to someone who say an atheist, they will then come up with their books and their documents and their scrolls and quote years. And this is the confusion I think not only with religion, with everything, which leaves me very confused about everything because it's just like, well, yeah, but you know, people tend to pick books and um, quotations and sources which fit their already existing beliefs? They absolutely do. And some, sometimes it's understandable. Sometimes it's, uh, it's not pleasant to, to <laughs> read the views of, of, of people who, who you think are morons. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, this is a, a terribly cruel thing to say, I'm, I'm very engaged with a number of people in Ukraine about the situation there. Yeah, but I'm not going to go onto the websites of either extreme ultra nationalists or uh, the the um, battalion of Donetsk. I'm not going to their website to hear their views because their views just offend me, and I'd rather not have them in my day. So uh, it's 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 understandable. However, I think uh, having said that, yeah, a lot of people could really benefit from from you know splitting their attention between the people who agree with what they already think and the people who have an alternate point of view. Isn't the answer, uh, part of the answer at least, tolerance? Yeah. Um, and, and this seems to be the problem that I see, that there's too much intolerance um, mm -hmm. towards other people's beliefs. I mean, what would an atheist say, um, 
what would an atheist problem be with a Christian? Do you think? I mean, could they could they live alongside each other, be happy, or you know, do, do, do you think there's ever an occasion where an atheist would be actually they're not really atheists, they're actually anti, say anti-Christian or anti-religion? They're antagonistic. Um, yes, you do get those people. Uh, uh, Dawkins is one of them, uh, who we mentioned at the start. He, as I said, he he runs around just harassing religious people. Um, and then you know he expects them to be to be gracious in response, and not all of them are because nobody likes being harassed. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are also people who find there are also people who, who who find the stories so silly that they they cannot uh, they can't abide that. You know, I mean, this, if if you break down the story of Noah's Ark, it's logically ridiculous. But, but uh, so what is my attitude? <laughs> um, and, and you know, like some of your favorite stories are logically ridiculous, um, and so, some of history is, is equally ridiculous. So it, it really, to me, it doesn't really matter. Isn't because, isn't reality ridiculous? It is, yeah. And see, this is another thing which uh, we need to understand in context. It, you could look at if you look at the world religions, um, the three religions which sprang from the Middle East, so Judaism, Christianity, and and Islam, uh, they have fundamental differences to the others, which is that they're based on historical accounts. They they are the the religions of of, of history. So they try they set out to prove an historical narrative which shows the existence of God. Other religions don't do that. So you will never get in in uh, in Buddhism, you know. Then this guy begat that guy, and that guy begat this guy, and God said to this guy, "Go and uh, release the people from from Burma." But it, the, the the historical narrative is not important. It's specifically important to these religions that came out of the Middle East. And I, I think that's uh, unfortunate because, you know, in a way, the historical truth of religion is n not. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter if some specific things were historically happened or not. It doesn't matter if Noah built a boat and put into a each animal. And in fact, you know, it, it's it's not possible because obviously the lions and tigers would have eaten all the others. But <laughs> but it's it just doesn't matter. What matters is um, how does it help people in their lives? How do people who believe in it uh, relate to each other and to the world in general? That's that's what really matters. Yeah, and. Um... Is there anything uh, positive you could say from an, an atheist point of view towards uh, Christianity, for example, since we're focusing on that religion at the, at the moment? Uh, positive things about Christianity? Hmm. Um, yeah, look, there are plenty. Um, we in Sydney, my hometown, uh, had an organization called the Wayside Chapel. Um, and the Wayside Chapel did great work with, with people who I would say, or, sorry, I, I think they still exist, so did and does great work, with, with people who, who many others in society would, would, would not be willing to put themselves out for, so prostitutes, drug addicts, and so on. There's a district in Sydney called King's Cross where uh, the drug trade and the, and the prostitution industry is, the, the, sorry, the, what do they call it now? The sex industry <laughs> is centred. Uh, and the Wayside Chapel do most of their work in that area, and they do excellent work for people who are often left behind by society. And you know, they're just one example of many. So, so in that regard, it doesn't. Again, we we can go back and argue. You know, are they moral because they're religious, or or, uh, or are they attracted to religion because they're moral, or or neither? Um, but but nonetheless, you know, I guess you can say. They give people the opportunity to to find an outlet for their compassionate urges, and and other people uh, other people's lives are greatly improved by that. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you one question. Um, forgive me if it's a bit of a stupid question, <laughs> <laughs> but you know I thrive on asking stupid <laughs> questions. Um, we all, we're all going to die at some point, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. When when it comes to be your turn, um, hopefully at a very old age of 120, um, and you wake you, uh, you 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 wake up after death, so you discover there is a world after death, and you wake up and you're in heaven, and you you find out that there that the Christianity version of events was true. Mm -hmm. What would you? How would you feel? I just wondered how you would feel if you found out later. This was true. I don't think. Look, I I, I feel that uh, if there is a God, it's 
not the God of the Westboro Baptist Church. The God of the Westboro Baptist Church cannot create a productive, vibrant universe such as the one in, in which we live. I, th I, I think we're all agreed on that. I mean, yeah. that was a pretty evil, <laughs> evil family. No, they're not all evil, to be honest. I found some of the, the, obviously, some of the daughters were just completely brainwashed, basically. Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I'm you are obviously sceptical of, re of religious claims in general, of supernatural claims in general, uh, but I'm especially sceptical of the idea that if you don't believe, you'll go to hell. Because I think all the characterizations that, that we have of God are that, that he, she, it, they, uh, wants us to live a, a good and moral life. And so if we do that to the best of our ability, uh, given what we know and our imperfect knowledge of the world and all that kind of stuff, then I would hope that, you know, if it turns out there is a God, then, then the God will, will take that into account. That's all. Okay, no, that's, that's a good answer. So basically, um, you would believe that as long as you try to live life to the best of your ability, you know, that you should, uh, you should make it to heaven if there is a heaven. That's kind of the classic agnostic point of view. Like, live a good life, and 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 so, and, and then you know you'll be okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and I and I think I, uh, I mean, uh, uh, given that we can't, as I said at the start, you know, escape the envelope of space time and see what God is like, I think that that seems perhaps less of a leap than than many of the other things that that some religions propose to be true. That's another thing I just wanted to, we'll, we'll probably come to a close soon, but sure. um, one thing about Christianity and, and some other religions too is that there's a heaven and unfortunately also a hell. Now if we talk about heaven, isn't it comforting, also com very comforting for people to believe in an afterlife and to believe that they're going to a better place? And you know, when if, if people lose family members, it can be very comforting to to feel that they've gone to a better place like just on a just on that kind of level isn't isn't that a really comforting thing for people uh yes and do you think uh, <laughs> do you think um that is just entire entirely a fabrication of of what people would like to believe i mean as an atheist do you not feel um do you not feel that life is almost kind of pointless in a way? Because obviously a Christian would believe that um, when they die, that's not the end. There is a point to life. Who, people aren't exactly sure what the point is, but at least when uh, they die, they maybe go on to something better. You know, They don't have to worry about all their loved ones dying because they've gone somewhere better or potentially somewhere worse. Um, an atheist doesn't have that to hold on to. So is it not kind of like... Uh, uh, an existence with very little meaning. That is that is a huge question that you just asked. I uh, I'll can you, try can you answer it in five seconds? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I would say okay. So first about life being meaningless. Um, I don't feel that my life is is meaningless. There uh, there are so many things about living that I love, and I know that at the moment of death, I'm going to be really pissed off <laughs> because I, I don't want to leave, you know, as hard as it sometimes gets, there's so much about the world that, that uh, is, is, is fabulous and interesting and, and enormously engaging and I, and I don't really need anything else. Um, about, uh, so what was the other part of the question? Uh, is, is heaven a fabrication and all that, all that sort of stuff? I, I don't mind if it is. I, I'm not it doesn't bother me that people, uh, if people seek comfort in that and it's true, great. If people seek comfort in that and it's not true, also great. I don't mind. And you don't need, uh, would you say you don't need that kind of comfort? No, I, I, I don't feel, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, another, there's another part of the argument too, which is you mentioned, you know, some people feel that they're going to a better place and, and there have been, uh, there have been philosophers who've, who've objected to that idea because it takes the emphasis a little bit off this place and how, you know, maybe this is the one shot we have and therefore we ought to look after the world as best we can, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, looking forward to an afterlife can, can 
I guess, take you a little bit out of the immediacy of being in this one. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. It is a, an endlessly interesting topic. And I, and I want to say it's only, what, episode 14 of Truth Sentinel, yeah? Yep. So congratulations on going within the space of 12 episodes from, uh, from does Tony Blair have inappropriate relationships with a journalist to does God exist? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, we, we hope to cover every topic uh, on yeah. Truth Sentinel. So, yeah, no, it's good that we're... No, it's, a good to, it's a good topic to tackle anyway. Not afraid to tackle the big questions, Scott. Absolutely not, no. And uh, we may not always answer the questions, but we'll at least ask the questions. Yeah. So, Anthony, thanks ever so much for giving us your views on um, and your research on atheism. And um, I hope you'll come back again in a couple of weeks, maybe, and uh, talk to us. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, and, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing the comments of your other guest, um, hearing what he has to say. So uh, cheers from me to Michael. Hello. I uh, hope you enjoy being on the show too. Just before we close, just to say again, and I, I feel like we should repeat this because we have got a lot of um, people listening of various different religions, that anything we've said is just just our personal opinions or we're asking questions. We're not I mean, I'm meaning to offend anyone who's Catholic. I certainly, I know friends who are Catholics and uh, we're just talking about certain aspects of things, so please don't be offended. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. As, as I think we've, we've been saying all along, you know, this, this, uh, this individual faith, which is, which is fine, uh, but there's a, there's a lot to analyze and uh, a lot to talk about, but none of it, certainly none of it is meant to offend or affront anybody's beliefs. Okay, good. And um, so speak to you again soon, yeah? Okay, all right, bye-bye. Okay, bye. So that was a discussion on atheism, Christianity and Islam, uh, and religion in general. Now we're going to go to our first listener to appear on Truth Sentinel, who's offered to come and speak to us all. Michael will be continuing the discussion on religion from the point of view of a Christian. Um, he's been a Christian, I think, for more than 20 years. Michael lives on a marina, so if you hear seagulls, boats or dogs, don't be alarmed, you're not hearing things. Um, the recording quality is not always perfect because of the, uh, the internet connection, but um, hopefully it's not too bad. Hi Michael. Hi Scott. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing great, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. Um, it's been a bit of a cloudy day here in England. Um, Lots of dark, dark clouds, um, but there's been a, the odd spot of sunlight, so it's it's been quite nice. I'm still enjoying nature out in here in the countryside, and I understand you're um, you're you're near a boat or near a river or something at the moment. Yes, I'm uh, on the island, or I should say, on Whidbey Island in the Pacific Northwest, the great state of Washington. Um, I'm in the city of Oak Harbor, and I live down at the marina on a 27-foot Albin Vega. I've got uh, oceanfront property. <laughs> and uh, how long have you been living there? I've been living here for two years, since September 2012. It sounds like, uh, I mean, I'd love to live in a place like that myself, on a boat or, or something like that. I mean, what made you uh, want to go and live on a boat? Is that is that a decision you made? Um, uh, due to any reason, or you just uh, you've always liked the sea. Oh, it's uh, definitely for a reason. My thoughts about it were that uh, okay, if everything's crumbling in in the country, and I'm I was just uh, laid off in July of 2012. Uh, I wanted to hook up with my my dad, who's a uh, Navy veteran. He was stationed right here at Oak Harbor as a jet engine mechanic and he retired here so I decided to come out here and in the back of my mind I thought I, I should get a sailboat and uh, when the zombie apocalypse happens I can always hop on the boat and, and sail off. How fast does this boat go? <laughs> oh it's probably gonna average about four knots. Okay so it should be fast enough to get away from the the zombies then. I was just worried that you would pull away too slowly. <laughs> well, it has an uh, 18 horsepower diesel engine. Okay, good. That, good. That's cool. cool. And um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I grew up on Maui. I was indoctrinated into the religion of Buddhism, uh, Mayana Buddhism. 
uh, your typical Honganji type of Buddhism. My parents didn't attend, but they sent me every Sunday. It's, it's, it's an interesting religion. I probably didn't really believe in it too much, but uh, uh, it's more of a philosophy than a philosophy for life uh, than a real religion, I think. So what age were you when you were a, uh, a Buddhist? Oh, probably from age 6 to about 12. So were you more a Buddhist because of your parents were into that, or were you consciously a Buddhist for your own choice, do you think? I was not consciously a Buddhist. I was just sent to Buddhist church. Actually, Buddhism has quite a good reputation amongst a lot of people for being a very peaceful religion and uh, generally oh, doesn't, yes. doesn't cause too many problems around the world, or hasn't seemed to. It's uh, a golden rule type of philosophy religion, that uh, if you do what's right and you think what's right, um, in the end you will be uh, moved up into the hierarchy of, of greater things after your death. Has it got the, the same sort of concept as uh, heaven and hell as Christianity? It sort of does. Uh, they do believe in, in a Buddhist heaven, which is their nirvana, but uh, their hell is more of a, a returning to this world in, in your reincarnation. So basically, if you don't live the right kind of life and you don't advance, uh, you either you are reincarnated back into this world, into this world of suffering. Okay, so this is hell that we're living in. Uh, basically, and, and we are at the top of the food chain. So we, we must have done something right when we were dogs. Oh, that's good. That's some good news. Um, and uh, are your parents still Buddhists? No. Uh, my mother, she's, she's now Christian, and she used to be this, this Buddhist uh, religion. And later she, she uh, took on a different, uh, more culty Buddhist uh, religion called uh, Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism. And their focus wasn't so much attaining enlightenment as it was to attain things here on this earth. And they believed in saying their, or doing their meditation and saying the secret word basically, that uh, unlocks the uh, desires of this world. Oh. And uh, so I went with her to that for a few few months. So, Michael, why did you move from Buddhism to Christianity? Well, I was uh, living my life and uh, trying to find uh, some sort of meaning to the whole life experience, and what I was interested in was leading a normal life like everybody else, and after a long tour in Germany in the 56 Field Artillery, uh, I had moved to Alabama next to, on my next duty assignment, and I came across a young lady and she invited me to go with her to her church. And of course, I wanted to know, is there, is there a God? I didn't have much faith in Jesus or Christian churches for that matter, but I said I'd give it a try and, and have a look into it. And I began going to the church with this uh, nice young lady. And I was uh, surprised because he, uh, after I was baptized uh, a few few weeks later, I had a uh, supernatural experience. Um, one day, this young lady and I we were walking. It was probably uh, early summer. We were walking together and discussing the meaning of life and the spirituality associated with Christianity. And she mentioned to me that we're living in the, in the end of times, that uh, Jesus will return soon. 
and as we we're discussing this whole nine yards, uh, we both looked up and there was an aurora borealis overhead uh, in the middle of the day in Alabama. Well, this was uh, that time in 1989 when uh, there was a major solar activity that I uh, here knocked out the Niagara grid. And just thinking about that, that instance in, in time is another reaffirmation for me that there is a higher power. I do believe that Jesus Christ came to bring us and to teach us, to bring us to him and, and to teach us about what he's expecting of us. And do you think um, um, someone who doesn't believe in God or doesn't follow Jesus still could have good morals? Or um, do you think Christianity provides those morals? Oh, most definitely. Uh, the role Jesus Christ plays is he is the sacrifice that God requires to bridge the gap between humans and and the divine and in essence he becomes and the judge so the God the Father and his son Jesus and the Spirit are all one entity and yet in three distinct forms uh, Jesus then fulfills um, the sacrifice called on for Abraham and Isaac, that was uh, a test back in the old times, and then God fulfilled it by sending his son to be sacrificed. So uh, people's sins could be forgiven? That's correct. Um, some people I've heard have said that, um, you know, the problem with Christianity is that um, if, if, if all your sins can be forgiven, then... What's to stop someone just continually sinning and then just keep asking for forgiveness? Um, your heart. Um, are you really sincerely penitent? If it's some sort of behavior that you're, you're sorry about and you ask for forgiveness, do you repeat that same behavior or negative, or let's say, let's say it's uh, adultery. Most of what it seems that God requires of us are common sense, um, positive, uh, moral values, such as thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not uh, murder, um, love thy neighbor. If, if you're not doing those things, um, and are willfully not doing those things, would you really ask for forgiveness if, and then repeat those behaviors if you were truly penitent? You understand what I mean. Yeah, you mean uh, basically that God knows whether you're really sorry or not because he can kind of read people's minds in some ways. Right. At the same time, you know, there's some, some behaviors, let's say, um, okay, there's one that I've been tossing about in my mind. Um, in the Old Testament, it talks about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and that uh, uh, gay sex is an abomination to God, okay? But you have these people that aren't attracted to the opposite sex. Um of course, it's hard for me to fathom it, but let's say, let's say heterosexual sex was an abomination to God. Then what would uh, uh, human beings do, at least regular heterosexual human beings? Um, we would be faced with quite a dilemma. Have to stay indoors um, with the doors I, locked. Yes. Um, and... What is the essence of 
of love. And when we think deeply about it, it's not necessarily the sex. The sex is just kind of something that evolves to in in the relationship and that leads to to having children and, and a family. But on the animalistic side, it's a drive in us. Now, homosexuals can't have children, so their sexual uh, activities don't ever uh, lead to procreation. Yet, it might be an expression of love. And even St. Paul, I believe, said that that uh, love covers a multitude of sins. So I think in the end, we have to leave the judgment of people's actions to the higher authority, to Jesus. Let him be the judge. Why people did what they did. Yeah, I mean, um, if someone's led a good, a good life and being kind to everyone and try to avoid sin as much as possible, but isn't actually a Christian, do you think they could still go to heaven? I think that that's uh, Jesus' choice. He has to judge. Um, and when when people are called to, to the judgment day, um, they'll go before him and he'll look at his book and their names will either be there or not, depending upon their not necessarily their works, but maybe their testimony before him at that time. What do you think is the um, the meaning of life, the purpose for people down here on earth uh, from a Christian point of view? From a Christian point of view, I think uh, it's pretty much the same as the Buddhist point of view. Um, do your best. Uh, understand that it's it's only temporary learn as much as you can try to understand explore it's kind of like a big playground and in the end god wants to pick out the the best fruit from the uh from the playground he doesn't want the uh the rotten ones that try to roll over all the other ones what he's looking for is that choice uh, choice cut. Does that? Do you mean like um, people should be striving for perfection? Not necessarily perfection, um, but I I do believe that he's looking for a good crop. Not necessarily just for the the most perfect blades of grass, but uh, for for a good harvest. Why do you think it's necessary to believe in God uh, and to believe in Jesus, to, uh, which seems to be a requirement of the Christian faith to get to heaven? Well, if it, if it's true that uh, from okay, let's let's take this back two thousand years. Um, Jesus came to fulfill prophecies that uh, were laid out by prophets of God for the is. Uh, for Israel and I believe that God understood that what would occur would occur that some some of the people would accept and other people would not and generally the ones who accepted were your average everyday person who probably was struggling a lot back then and then the people in power who were basically oppressing the people through uh, their power in, in the Roman establishment uh, and those who basically were looking for power uh, wanted to hold on to that power and therefore rejected um, the Messiah. What would you say to people who say there is no God, what's the evidence for you uh, that there is a God? I can understand why they would say that there is no God. Um, 
just from observation. You don't really see any real reason to believe in in a god. But when you, I suppose, surrender that disbelief and take a leap of faith and say, okay, I'm going to learn about this this uh, religion and open my heart up to it uh, and ask for some sort of confirmation that there is, then there might be a re revealing for, for people. Uh, there could be people who have tried and there may not be a God. Uh, but from my situation, uh, I asked the question and I got a, a answer and therefore I believe. Talking about um, asking questions and getting answers, um, a lot of people I think feel like if they pray to God they don't actually have, they don't get any answers back. It's, it's sort of like talking to yourself almost. Um, it, it requires a lot of faith. Um, do you ever feel like you do get definite answers to prayer or um, how do you think people can communicate with God? I, I completely agree with that statement. Uh, God answers in very subtle ways. For, for one instance, I, I always talk about the Aurora Borealis, and a confirmation that he exists. Um, because at that very moment, we, we saw something occur. Um, throughout history, people believe in ghosts. Uh, I've never seen a ghost, but do I believe that there are ghosts? Uh, I do know that when my grandmother passed away, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night in Germany and I just knew that she had gone. Um, and I didn't confirm that until probably six months later when I got out of the military and went to go visit her that she had passed away, but uh, I knew that something bad had happened to her and that uh, she had left us. Some things are very coincidental. Um, you could say that, oh, the Aurora Borealis, that was just a coincidence, but Coincidences are like lightning. They don't strike, you know, over and over repeatedly unless there is something behind it. But why, why can't God just communicate freely with people, do you think? I don't think he wants to. I don't think he wants to. Uh, um, he wants to leave, for some reason, us to uh, make a leap of faith. Of course, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you would expect the normal rational thing to do is to hover up in the sky on a cloud of uh, uh, a kingdom castle cloud and, you know, point fingers at people and say, you're doing the wrong thing and zap them with lightning, such sort of thing. But maybe it's in his plan somehow that... Uh, we all have to make an effort and a leap of faith. Um, do you feel like, uh, well, I know a lot, a lot of people feel like a lot of people become Christians because they've maybe reached a low point in their life. Um, people are just needing something, someone to comfort them and they don't have anyone there. So they, they like to believe that someone's listening. That definitely could be a, a, a very good reason, and uh, a lot of people that I've come across uh, seems like the converts, uh, a lot of them converted for that reason, that they were looking for, for some sort of spiritual guidance, and that they were looking for comfort. This girlfriend of mine that uh, I spoke about, while she was in the military, she was so miserable that for a period of time she was strung out on heavy drugs, uh, heroin and uh, other things, and she was completely 
out of control. And when she finally bend, bended her knee and accepted God, she changed. She, she became, she went from basically demon to saint. And I, I hear those stories a lot. You know, you can just listen to Steve Quayle. Steve Quayle will, will say the same. Now, I personally have never had any trouble. I've always striven to be uh, on the right side of everything. Um, so I don't have that kind of testimony. But I can definitely say that I asked the question, is there a God? And I got an answer. And therefore I follow. And you mean Steve Quell, who's often on uh, Hagman and Hagman? Yes. Mm -hmm. His testimony, he was uh, a drunken biker for a while. A, a real hell raiser. <laughs> so you think that Christianity can change people's lives around and can be a good force for uh, for good in, in people's lives in general? Yes, definitely. And it takes a lot. Uh, I think it takes something supernatural to actually change people, especially that dramatic. Um, one question a lot of people would ask um, a Christian and maybe other people with other religions as well is, why does God allow so much suffering to happen on the earth and doesn't sort of uh, try to stop some of it? Again, I, I want to point out that this world is just temporary, that the life that we're leading here is kind of like a, a training ground, a school, a chance to experience things. And there are experiences in life, and depending upon the different degrees, uh, suffering is, is definitely one of the experiences that we all have. Some people suffer from different diseases, other people suffer from loved ones being lost. This life is just a drop in the bucket. It's, it, God allows a lot of the suffering to happen for our benefit. Does Christianity, just to change the subject uh, quite a bit, does Christianity fit in with evolution? Well, I want to say that evolution is just a theory. Okay, It makes sense, but nobody really knows the truth yet. I see that people are different than, than the animals. Um, although, you know, our bodies are similar, there's something different about people. And do you think there's um, something special about our planet as well? Are, are, are we the center of the universe? Or as some people argue that there's, there's many universes and, you know, we're not, um, we're not, particularly special and that although the although our planet and all the all life on this planet seems very complex if there's thousands of thousands of universes then um, it could just be some cosmic accident Earth and well nobody really knows but if we think of uh, everything outside of us as being uh, infinite, and, you know, infinite universes, infinite space, infinite time, then where is the center of the universe? Well, uh, I must be the center of the universe because everywhere I look, it's, it, it's infinity outwards. And, it, you know, this comes back to, you know, uh, some of Descartes thinking, uh, uh, I know I'm real, but what about you? Are you? I'm not sure, to be honest. Are you more than an algorithm? I believe uh, so, but um, yeah, we we actually we actually spoke about that before. That um, one scientist had said that uh, he actually said it was probable we're living in a simulation of a past, mm -hmm. a past, um, a past world that did exist, and that we're just a simulation, uh, because he said that in the future, computer game technology and uh, simulation technology will become so advanced that we'll be able to create. Uh, copies of uh, the universe and how it existed he's he's speculating um as we all speculate and who really knows the truth i'd like to hear what the illuminati think <laughs> if, <laughs> with if, their anubis statues and <laughs> if they exist of course 
Yes, if they exist. And this is part of the problem is like knowing uh, what the actual truth is. I mean, for example, there's a lot of researchers um, I've heard about that say Jesus was not the person depicted in the Bible and that um, even things like the Ten Commandments, they came from another uh, religion that, that predated uh, Christianity and that some of the ideas from Christianity have just been borrowed and it's basically been fabricated. What do you say to the people that you, uh, base their ideas on this kind of research? I would say, hey, I'm a skeptic too. Um, show me the evidence. I'll think about it. And maybe I'll pray about it and I'll see what happens. Maybe I'll get a uh, coincidence that will change my mind. I mean, if, if someone was to present the evidence, it's probably going to be in the form of um, books and... Uh, you know, quotations and, um, you know, they'll back it up with um, bibliographies of, of scholars and things like that. How do we know which is the correct version of events? Because you can read a book which will scientifically say Christianity is uh, correct and uh, all these scholars skip and academic research is all sound and that, you know, things haven't changed too much from the original texts. And then you can read another book will say that it's all nonsense, uh, it's all been fabricated. So how, how does anyone know what to believe? Right, uh, that's a good question. I would say that if, if there truly is a God, um, he'll try to lead you and uh, make a confirmation for you in some way or form. Now, let's say I wanted to worship uh, Thor uh, and I made a proclamation uh, to Thor, and then lightning struck. Uh, that would be probably <laughs> enough for me to say, yes, I'm going down the right path. Um, I think it's up to the individual and, and the, the path that he's following to find truth. Um, and it may necessarily not necessarily be true. I'm not going to say that uh, Thor is untrue because I don't know. Uh, I haven't gone down that path, but uh, definitely I am convinced that uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How about um, the Bible itself? Do you take it literally? I mean, was the earth created in seven days and was there a worldwide flood with a a guy called Noah who put all the animals onto the ark? I don't know. But I will take it literal uh, just for the, the sake of it. But I understand that there could be some artistic license in it. And um, who created God? Aha! Uh -huh. I don't think anybody created God. He just was. Of course, I don't know. I just, thought, just I, I just thought I'd ask in case you did in case you did know. No. <laughs> how how do you feel about the difference between the old and the new testaments? Now there seems to be a lot of death and destruction involving armies destroying cities and non-believers uh, in the old testament and cutting off of limbs and things like that if people steal things, which is still practiced in some countries such as Saudi Arabia. It doesn't seem to fit in with uh, the New Testament with Jesus uh, saying, love one another. Um, how do you account for that? Yeah, that's that's a pretty tough question, uh, Scott. Um, in the Old Testament, you look at the, the, the narrative, um, and a lot occurs under the guidance of Moses, uh, the Mosaic laws, and the dietary laws, and the stoning of uh, sinners. Um, I'm not too fond of a lot of those uh, concepts, but it, I think at that time uh, they used harsh punishments for basically crimes against uh, uh, God and, and different sins. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with them, but at the same time, that you, was the case, that the laws were set down. 
Do you think it's necessary to be, to believe and understand uh, everything in the Bible to be a Christian? I mean, do you have a lot of questions yourself about Christianity? No, I don't believe that uh, you have to uh, believe everything or to know everything. Um, one of the curses of being an intelligent person uh, and a wondering person is that you do go out and, and learn and just not blindly believe. Like hmm, the most humble people, and I think the most uh, blessed people are the simplest. The simplest people that uh, to a lot of people don't are just dullards, uh, blindly believe things when it comes to Christianity, they're, they're probably blessed in that uh, they just blindly believe that the, the earth was definitely created in seven days. And they don't question, they just believe, just because maybe they don't think very much. <laughs> Doesn't it then make it very difficult to believe... Uh things in the Bible if you're not sure what's true and what's li what's literal, what's not literal? I'm not so concerned about uh, uh, some of those things. Um, some of it is, has artistic license. Fine, yeah, no, I wanted to uh, move on to talk about the, the uh, Catholic uh, religion. Um, basically, um, you know, yes. the Jesus talks about, you know, giving all your money to the poor and... Uh, being good to one another and being humble and uh, sometimes when you look at the Catholic Church, the Vatican in particular, uh, and the Pope, it, it doesn't seem to reflect some of the teachings of Jesus, for example, like uh, with the Vatican owning hundreds of millions, I think even billions of yes, dollars, um, you know, where they, they could probably end, um, say, you know, uh, things like malaria in Africa in one foul swoop with, with some of the money they've got. Um, the Pope seems to allow people to almost worship him in the hundreds of thousands. And sometimes when I see them all gathered listening to the Pope, there's very little mention of Jesus. Uh, what do you feel about that? Yes, um, I, I would tend to agree. Um, there has been much corruption within the Catholic Church uh, dating back a thousand years. Um, if you sit and study history, the original church began after Constantine, and you could say that the Orthodox are probably carrying on the faith better than the Catholic Church. Um, at the same time, whenever anything gets organized to a point you, you get the corrupt figures within the system and they start off amassing wealth and basic uh, human desires, uh, treasures, uh, and selfishness and greed. And this hasn't escaped the, uh, the Catholic Church at all. It escapes individual Christians but not the, the mechanism. The mechanism is turned into a, a basically a, a monarchy uh, where these so-called Christian leaders fight amongst themselves to see who's going to become the, the king. And that's not very Christian. Indeed. Um, should, um, should people fear death if they're not Christian? No, I don't believe so. I believe that that uh, Jesus will judge us on on our our souls, our our hearts and our souls. Just just as if uh, an unbeliever would come before uh, Jesus and after he had passed away on or on uh, Judgment Day, uh, Jesus would uh, look at the man and uh, just like on. While he was on the cross, there were there were two thieves next to him. One thief uh, ridiculed Jesus and said, "If you be the Son of God, then take yourself off the tree." 
And the uh, other thief said to him, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And that was the first man that was saved by Jesus, I do believe, one of the, the two murdering thieves. He repented right there and then on the cross because he had a good heart. Christians believe there's going to be a rapture when um, Jesus comes back and uh, people are taken up into heaven. Do you believe that and do you know when it's going to happen? Uh, I do not believe in the rapture. I do believe in suffering. I believe that we should suffer just as much as Jesus suffered, and we can expect it. What, what kind of that suffering do you mean, sorry? I, I mean that uh, our leader was crucified uh, and underwent a lot of torture uh, on his last day. We should expect the same. And if we, if we do not get the same, then we were blessed, but we can expect to walk in our in in our uh, in our God's footsteps. Do you think um, if if you if you're a Christian, it's compatible with other religions? I mean, is it possible for a Christian to be friends with Muslims and uh, with Jewish people, for example? Of course, yes. I uh, while I was working in the pharmaceutical field, I had several Muslim friends. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, although I did know a, a couple of Jewish people, uh, they weren't is easy to talk to about their faith because a lot of them didn't know anything about their faith. But as far as Muslims, their philosophy and their religion is very similar to Christianity, except that there is a God and Muhammad is his prophet and Jesus was just a prophet as well, but not as important as Muhammad. So that's my understanding of uh, the Muslim faith. Uh, but I believe it's a beautiful religion. Do you feel? Do you think that um, uh, Islam and the Muslim religion is less tolerant than, say, the Christian religion? I see that there's extremists in both religions. Uh, on one hand, we had uh, Catholics that uh, would burn heretics at the stake. Uh, they burned uh, Saint Joan of Arc for being a witch. Um, as anything that threatens the uh, power structure is going to, uh, that power structure is going to convince other people to do bad things, basically. As we're coming to the end, uh, do you believe we're living in end, the end times at the moment? I do, I do. Uh, but at the same time, the end times are at hand for each each and every one of us. Um, no matter what you do in the world, the different people that you meet, you'll find about the same thing. Uh, we're all living here, we're all trying to figure out what's going on. We're all very similar. Um, whether or not it's the end times as forecast by uh, St. John um, is irrelevant because the end time could come at any moment for you or I or uh, anybody that you look at. Uh, I just live a few miles from where that big mudslide occurred here in Washington that wiped out about 40 people. Um, and all over the, the world, people are being, their lives are ending here on this, in this existence, uh, game over, basically, in the video game term. Yeah, so for some people, the, the you know, for each and every one of us, there's going to be an end time at some point, I guess. Um, how about Revelations and the Mark of the Beast? Uh, do you think that's all going to happen? I think uh, it's very possible that uh, in order to buy or sell, we're going to have to uh, take the mark of the beast here shortly. I myself will not, and uh, I expect to be FEMA camp. I heard about these FEMA camps that are, are being built or have already been built in the, in the States. Is there a lot of uh, fear about that amongst people? Uh, not, not from the average citizen that's uh, unaware of unaware that, uh, that their government is capable of... Uh, bringing down buildings and blaming it on them, other people, just to, to perpetuate the system that they've created. But, but basically, you're ready to escape on your boat uh, should something big happen, yeah? Ah, uh, sure. Uh, if I feel the need to leave, I can leave. And I like that uh, feeling of freedom. That's Dude. the most important part I that I cherish is my freedom. So uh, where would you head to? I would... Uh, Head to the middle of the Pacific. I'd let God uh, take take the helm.
So thanks for uh, thanks for coming on, Michael, and uh, telling us your what it's like to be a Christian and your views on Christianity. Um, so we're very grateful for you coming on and sharing that with us. Well, it's been my pleasure, Scott. Uh, I was able to. Well, I hope I was able to uh, help people to and try something new and try to learn something new. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I think we've there's been a lot of information you've given us, and um, I hope you'll come back again soon at some point. Sure, anytime. Take it easy, have a good uh, rest of the day, and um, speak to you again. Yes, thanks, Scott. Have a great day. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. So it was good to hear from uh, Michael. And remember, if there's something you would like to come on and talk about, drop us an email, scottsentinel9 at gmail.com, and we'll see if we can get you on. Uh, also, don't forget to come and say hi to us on Facebook or Twitter. Look for Scott Sentinel or Truth Sentinel. Um, topics coming up in future episodes could include enemies of the state, Hollywood secrets, mysterious celebrity deaths, planned obsolescence. We might even do one a show on food, health, and a lot more. Give us some, if you've got any ideas, just leave some comments in the comments section of YouTube. Uh, this is the section where we normally talk about um, any, if, there's seen, if there's any news to do with economic markets, sports, space or weather. I just noticed there was, um, there was an article saying there was drones over the Champions League final uh, watching uh, over the crowd. Um, that was in the Champions League final, um, soccer or football if you're in the UK. I think this is going to become more and more common to have drones flying around. I think they're just getting us used to them. Um, and this technology is going to change so much in the next 30 years. I, th I don't think it will be long before spider-like drones like those in the minority report will come walking into your room just to, just to check you're not up to anything. Um, and, you know, people think that's nonsense, but, you know, we're living in a sci-fi world now where, you know, we've got this kind of technology. It's not going to be long before they use it. I think George Orwell's 1984 was a kind of like a, a blueprint for the future. Anyway, um, there does seem to be a correlation with the concept of sport and government control. You look at the days of the gladiators when people were fed to the lions. Um, I bet if that still continued to this day, then a few whistleblowers would find themselves staring into the jaws of a lion. If you are a whistleblower, um, before this happens, before we return to the days of the gladiators, come on Truth Sentinel and tell us what you know. Um, to finish today, as it's been quite a long episode, I'm sort of going to finish fairly quickly. just want to say, um, Albert Einstein, uh, I came across an Albert Einstein quote this week, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. I was thinking of um, printing some Truth Sentinel t-shirts with that quote on it and maybe other quotes similar let me know if you'd be interested in those that's one thing we could start selling on here i don't want i don't want this this um channel to be about making money too much but we we do need to try to fund the show a little bit so you know if you'd be interested in t-shirts let me know what you think about that also if you'd like to advertise on here if it's something that fits in with the ethos of truth sentinel then let us know so any sponsors, advertisers, people who'd like to finance the show, please get in contact, scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening today. Catch you later. Goodbye.